Little camera dude. Alright. Alright. We're gonna get into uh, chapter six. We're doing it. We're crazy. Uh, the first section in 6 1 is. is nice. Let me just ask you what you think of this. If I had. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I had one function and another function. Let's say to meet at A and then meet at B. And I want to know what's the integral, what's the area in there? It's the area in the exactly. Yeah, so when you integrate, now which one's on top? That's the important thing here, right? F of x. So it's going to be, in this case, if I integrate f of x from a to b, I get all this area. If I integrate g of x from a to b, I get this area. So of course, to get the area in there, I just subtract those two areas. It's almost too simple, right? Beautiful visualization of this, right? So in this case, it would be the integral of whatever the hell f of x is minus whatever the hell g of x is. So there, there are several things here, though. They're not always going to tell you where they intersect. That obviously is a key point. Where do they intersect, right? So one, so here's uh, uh, things that make this hard, problems. One, what are A and B? Sometimes they'll just tell you, and you're like, thank you, problem. And sometimes they'll just say, find the area between these two curves. Oh, shit. So you've got to find out where they intersect. You've got to find A and B. Uh, the second problem is which is on top? Or G. Right? I'll have to just see who's giggling when I say that. <laughs> All right. uh, let's see, what else? Or something else? Oh, uh, the third problem is when if you have something like this, what if you've got here's F and here's G. And they want to know from A to B, what's the area between the two? What's the problem there? Yeah, so I want to find this area here. So I have to first find what? The area from A to the C point. So, yeah, let's call this C. It's a good idea like that. So the area between the curves in the interval A to B would be the integral from a to C, and in this case, how do I write the inside? F of x minus g of x. Yeah, because f of x is on top. I like it. So it would be f of x minus g of x, dx, plus the integral from c to b. Now g is on the top. I like it. I like it. I like it. Cool. So that's the way they're going to make these problems. Uh, that's the way these problems could be more difficult. You have those considerations, right? Does this make sense so far? Yes, ma'am. So, that you're taking the sum of the two parts, pretty much? Beautiful. Okay. Because if you just did this one from A to B, what would happen that you can't let happen? If you did just, if you just did one, if you just did the integral of F minus G from A to B, what would happen that you can't let happen? Can somebody see? Yeah. Yeah, parts of the areas we cancel out. I want to know the total area contained between those functions. So if I just do this, part of the area is going to be negative. Now, in general, negative area is not bad, unless my problem is I want to know the area between these two functions. I can't let that be negative area, right? That doesn't make any physical sense. This is a little more physical problem. Visually, I know this area should come out positive, right? It should be more than just this area by itself. That's why I have to break this up. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yes, sir. problem with underneath the x-axis? Oh, the beautiful thing is it doesn't matter where it is. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's, it, it, this is even easier than it could be. 
Because no matter where f of x is, I know, I love it. It wasn't really clear there, but it was too bad for me. Uh, wherever f of x is and wherever g of x is, it doesn't matter who's where, uh, the area between the two is just going to be the top minus the bottom. No matter where the hell it is, because the area doesn't change if I pick it up and move it all below the x-axis, right? The area is the same. So it doesn't matter. All that matters is those things, right? And then this third, this problem here, it's the third problem. C? 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 Okay. So let me give you an interesting problem to try out. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, let's do that. I like it. You guys try this one. Find the area between... You should be able to give yourself a decent rough sketch. It's not necessary, but it will help you if you draw it well. It will kind of help you see what, what's going on. So it pretty much outlined your attack, right? I didn't tell you what A and B are. What's up? Let's see. All right, let's make sure everybody's on the right track. So how do I find where A and B are? Graph both the first form. Yeah, uh, graphically you could do, but it, I actually want to find these first maybe before I graph. So I know the rough sketch of these. I know what this parabola looks like. I know the x-intercepts for this, so I can draw this parabola. I know it opens down. All right, those kind of things are what lets you make a really quick rough sketch. The thing you want to get exactly right, though, is where they meet, what A and B are. So let me first figure that out analytically, right? So how, how do I find out where these meet? I just set them equal to each other. When do you equal the you? That, that's, I'm going to force them to tell me. So then I add x squared. They both might like Marshall did. Subtract 2x. Good job. Factor it out. Please, dear God. Hopefully, nobody divided by two x. <laughs> Very cute, but but don't don't laugh too much. I mean, that would be a part of me would go, okay, that's not a bad idea. But why is it a bad idea? Because you only get one, one zero. Because then you lose a zero. You never want to divide by something that could possibly be zero. 
because then you lose that answer, or you lose an answer associated with it. So I don't want to divide by x minus 1, because x equals 1 could be part of the answer. I guess do So you always want to get it over and factor it, which is like you learned way back when. So you do get x equals 0 and x equals 1 to guess. All right, so when I graph this, I just kind of focus on those. And of course, what are the x-intercepts of this? What are the x-intercepts of this? Zero. That would be uh, zero, two. Zero, two. Factor it, two minus x is in there. <laughs> so, and I know two is not in our little thing here, but who cares? I want to graph it. I want to give a rough sketch of this parabola, so I know it's zero to two. And I know at one, where is this? One. That's right. All right, so. so at one, it's one, and then it opens down. Whoa. All right, and then this guy is just a plain old normal parabola. So I can bring it. So at zero, it's zero. At one, it's one. And we knew that because that's we just proved that that's where they overlap. Cool. So here comes this guy. So he would be. Who cares? And make that bigger. Yay. So from zero to one is where all this stuff is happening, and now I see which one's on top. Yeah, the downward opening parabola is on top. I like it. And that's a huge point that sometimes students just skip over. They just write the first function they write in the book. They write that first. And sure, about half the time, you'll be right. Half the time. Half the time, roughly. That's a good statistical guess. So this would be integral from what? Zero to one. Zero to one. And why, why are you looking here? Because everything's been controlled by what variable? X. X is controlling everything. Why am I making a big deal out of that? Because we are going to have some problems where Y is going to be controlling everything. We're going to go on the Y axis. Crazy sauce. Let's see. So, so what goes inside now? Good. Top one first minus the other one. All right, let me stop there for a second. Just don't lose touch with the physical idea of this problem. I'm subtracting the two areas, so I get the area between. So the physical idea is just really simple. And now this interval is going to be simple because i got a nice, uh, what do you call it, Jeff? You call it a polynomial in there. Power rule, right? So how do you integrate that? So it would be x squared minus 1. x squared minus? Um, 2 thirds, 3. Good. 2x two cubed over 3. Did I talk about why we don't write plus c when it's a definite integral? Because they cancel each other. Good. I like it. Because both that have two parts. Both c's would kill each other. I like it. I just want to make sure. I couldn't remember if I said that before or not. And I want to evaluate that from 0 to 1. So this is the standard accepted notation for this. Some of you guys still have the integral symbol even though you've already integrated. And I think you're doing it just so you remember what to integrate it between, but that's sort of misleading. You're saying you haven't integrated it yet if you still have an integral symbol. So that's the standard accepted way of remembering what the hell you're going between. And so you get... Yeah, the nice thing is zero is going to make everything zero, so you just care about what one is. One minus two-thirds. One third. One third. Craziness. So what's the area of this box? One. So we just figured out that that is one third of that box, roughly. And of course, my scale sucks, but oh well. You guys kind of with me? Yeah, feeling it. Dude, I like it. I was about to say, as long as you have its consent, but then that sounded weird. <laughs> and then I've said it anyway, shit. All right. So that's, that's a basic problem. Now, I was trying to find one that's got. Oh, let's do this. Let's do one on the y axis. And let me show you why we do it. Real quick. Um, real quick. Why is x squared? Now, considering we only go from 0 to 1, how could I solve this for x? Why did I just say what it said? Con considering it goes from 0 to 1, how do we solve it for x? Yes, why did I say it that way? Yeah, it's the square root of y. Why do I have to put plus or minus? Because I'm dealing with an area where y is always positive, I like it. But but can you solve this for x? Hell no. So this is a really good uh, 
thing to realize when you have a problem, you're like, you can do it one way, you can do it using X's or using Y's. And I know we've done like one problem in class where we looked at the Y axis, right? That I can remember. But it's going to become more and more important. So starting now, we're going to start looking at a lot more. It doesn't matter which axis we use. I can turn the whole damn thing around. Who cares? It's kind of arbitrary. But this one tells me I am never going to do integral dy because I can't get a function of y. You would, like, it's not that I can't, but it, you actually could, believe it or not. You wouldn't want to. <laughs> right? So, yeah, we won't. That would be gross. Right? Uh, so let's do one where you have to do it using y. Forced. You are forced. You Sorry, libertarians. <laughs> they have guns. I don't know. If I want to force them to do anything. So find the area closed by y equal x minus 1. And what else, Jeff? I don't know, man. Yeah, cool. So we're going to do this, well, we'll see. We'll do it a certain way, and then I'll show you what it would look like if we tried to do it the other way. So you start to get a feel for this, right? The first step is you set them equal to each other to figure out what A and B are, to see where the, uh, the endpoints are. Let's make sure everybody's got the first step done. So here's the trick with this. How do you set these equal to each other? You have to get x to be... Or, or do you have to set them equal to each other? This is what I should have said. You have a system of equations. What other method do you have to solve it? Substitution. I love it. So this was actually more like... Uh, this was substitution, wasn't it? That's what setting it equal to each other means, because they already have y by itself, so if you replace y with x squared, you get this. Bam. Bam. So here, I've got y and y squared. I really don't want to make that size for I could, and then square and get it to where I'm going to be, but it's a little bit easier just to look at it like I'm going to replace that y with x minus, x minus, minus 1, because that's what freaking y is. So I get x minus 1 squared, 2x plus 6. Or, you know, you can solve this for x and plug it in. doesn't really matter which variable you get first. So you get x squared minus 2x plus 1 equals 2x plus 6. x squared minus 4x minus 5 equals 0. Sorry. That's good. And... Zero, so x equals negative one and five. Kick ass. Right, so now we know where they cinch off at the ends, right? What is on top? We'll find out. Right. I always think about have you guys ever seen those uh, Christmas things where you pull on the ends and it pops open and oh. toys pop out? Have you ever seen those? Poppers is what they used to call them. 
Uh, that's what I always think about when we see these, where they cinch off at the end so they look like poppers. Right? So we're just trying to find where the ends of the popper are. Um, so here I've got y equals x minus 1 is pretty easy to graph, thank God. All right, it's got a y intercept of negative 1 and a slope of 1. It's crazy. Up one over 1, up one over 1, up one over 1. Yeah. And I know i got to go out to 5, right? So 5 is at 4. Wow, my scale is awesome. 5 is at 4, and that's roughly straight when you do this. Okay. And then how do I graph the other dude? You do it. So what you do is, now watch. If I had this equation, how would you graph that? See, you could graph this pretty easily, right? Mm -hmm. No problem. So let's, that poor little dude is not written in the same format. Right? You could, or you could solve for x. So x equals 1 half y squared minus 3. three. So you guys are with me on that. And either way you do it, actually, you could even, uh, what would the x-intercept be? Negative 3. Negative 3, and you can see that there, right? Yeah. Because now it's solved for x, that's an x-intercept. I like it. So when y is 0, x is negative 3. You can do it, Jeff. y is 0, x is negative 3. But now, uh, the important points are at 1, I, I'm sorry, at uh, negative 1. So I didn't go far enough back here. Negative 1 and 5, right? That's where they meet. Uh, x points is where they meet for the x values. Let me stop there for a second. That's why I always find out where they meet before I start to graph it, because then I know I want to include those points on my sketch. Right? So obviously, at negative 1, what's the output of that? Uh, when x is negative 1. It's going to have to be. And you can see it. What's it going to be? When x is negative 1, what do you get here? 4, which is 2. Yeah, so x is negative 1, I get y squared equals 4. So y is? 2. Uh, plus or minus 2. It's a parabola, right? It's just opening the this way. It's opening sideways, which you should have analyzed in pre calc Sideways open parabolas. So 1 is a negative 2, and the other one's at? Positive 2. And then, of course, where else is it supposed to overlap? 5. So when x is 5, y squared is 16, so y is plus or minus 4. So it's at 4 and negative 4. Good job. Good job. So here's our parabola. Everything you know about functions of x are exactly the same for functions of y. It's just, it's just all turned, right? So I could actually even find, uh, well, we know what the vertex is, but negative b over 2a would still work, believe it or not. It would just tell you the y piece, and you plug it back in to see the x piece. Oh, you guys are with me. Remember negative b over 2a? Beautiful little shortcut to find the vertex. It'll still work, but instead of x, it would be y because negative b over 2a. Okay, the y piece of the vertex. All right. So everything that you could use before, you can still use. Um, so what area am I talking about? I'm talking about obviously this area. So here's the thing: if you wanted to use the x variable, what two things are kind of bad about that? If we wanted to use, if we wanted to integrate something dx. You guys see what would be wrong. So, for example, uh, can we kill each other? Here, what's the top? Here, the top function is the blue dude, right? The top function would be y squared equals two x plus six, and the bottom function would be y equals x minus one. Where does that relationship change? See, at the top is the blue line, and the bottom is the black line, right? Where would that relationship change? At what point? X-axis. Here. Right? Uh, and so what happens with this area back here? Do you see what I'm saying? So you'd have to break it up into two intervals. So that's one thing. 
You guys are with me or not? The second thing is, you'd have to solve this for y, introducing a square root, which itself would require to be broken up into two pieces. So what, what's the top part here? The top part of the parabola. It would be y equals the positive the square root of 2x plus 6. And what's the bottom part? y equals negative the square root of 2x plus 6. I don't know if you guys... So if I wanted to set that integral up, just for this piece right here, just to look at this piece right here, it would be the integral from negative 3 to 1. Is that cool? Uh -huh. I'm sorry, I want to go y. No, no, that's coming up later. Negative 3 to 1 on the x-axis. The top part would be the positive rad 2x plus 6, and the bottom part would be the negative uh, 2x plus 6. So you actually end up adding minus the negative. That's kind of a gross interval. In fact, this would be a very difficult interval. Well, just because this is linear would make it easier, but still, it's not as nice as I want it to be. Why is it easier to look along the y-axis? If you look along the y-axis, let me see if I can get you guys forced to do this. Along the y-axis, are there any changes in the relationship between what's on top and what's on the bottom? If I look in the y-axis direction, what's the top part? Which function is bigger? The x-axis. Yeah. Y minus 1. It's always the top part. All the way through, right? Yeah. And the bottom part is always that guy. So the top would be x equal to y plus 1. That's the top. It's a function of y because I want to go along the y-axis. And the bottom part would be that guy. So if you want to go along the y-axis, you have to solve everything you've got for x. Because what do you need inside of integral dy? You need functions of y. Same way if I got integral dx, I need functions of x. So if I want to do it this way, I need that. If I want to do it this way, I need that. Okay, let me stop there for a second. This is kind of a new idea for us, because we haven't, like I said, we haven't done a lot of integration on both axes. We only focused on the x-axis just to get freaking used to integration in the first place. Now we're starting to realize, well, the x and y axes are completely arbitrary. Totally arbitrary. So I should be able to do integral dy just like integral dx. Hmm. So you still go left to right? I still go, well, I go left to right or bottom to top, right? Because if I want to go integral along the y-axis, what would the what would the limits be? What's y go from to? So at the bottom of this area, what's y? Negative two. So I'm doing dy, right? Dy from negative two to what? Four. Same way I would say if I wanted to do this way, it would be from negative 3 to 5, but I have to break that up because i got weird shit going on. At some point, the relationship changes. Why is it a better choice here? For two reasons. One, the relationship doesn't change, and two, the functions are better looking. Right? They're polynomials, not radicals. Sometimes if you try to do it one way, you get an impossible interval. That's a huge red flag saying, hey, don't do it down. Use the other x's, right? Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. So what would, what would it look like inside? Four, 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 four. Yeah, because that's the top, dude. That's on top. Why is that on top? It's, you're like, no, it's not, Jeff. It's on the freaking right side. Well, if you turn your head, that's on the freaking top. It's bigger. Its outputs are bigger, so it's on the top. Right? So it's going to be y plus 1 minus... One half y squared. Yeah, one half y squared minus three. So it's still the top function, the bigger outputted function, minus the smaller output function. It's just in the y direction. So I need functions of y on the inside. Okay, I like it. So cleaning the inside up a little bit. Good. Y minus one half y squared. Plus four. And now you just integrate that. This polynomial that kicks ass. How do you integrate that? Y squared, y squared over two. Over two. Y, cubed. y cubed over three, and there's a two down there already, so it's y cubed over six. six. Plus 
4 y from negative 2 to 4. And then I just got to plug and shut it. Unfortunately, one of our inputs is not zero. Too bad for us. So we get a minus 32 over 3 plus 16 minus 2 plus, let me see if you guys, well, let me do this. Let me do this. I'm trying to be all slick. Um, here's a mistake some of you guys make when you do this, so to be really careful about this. This would be plug a 4 in. Minus the whole thing. Don't just put a minus sign and start doing stuff. Minus everything with a negative 2 plugged in. Mm. It is so stupid easy to make a, a sign mistake, right? Uh, especially when you try to do it all in your head, like I was trying to do it. Like, wait, so see, negative 2 squared over 2 minus negative 2 cubed over 6 plus 4 times negative 2. But I can focus on this and focus on that and then make that, whatever that number is, make it the opposite mm -hmm. side. Right? So you get 4. 8. Uh, plus 16, I get 24 minus 64 over 6, which is 32 over 3, minus, I get 2 plus 8, 6, which is 4 thirds, minus 8. So I get 24 minus negative 6 is 30. Say again? 4 times 4. Where am I looking? On top. There's a four times four. Yeah. Sixteen oh. and eight. Oh. Yeah. So then we get thirty-two thirds, negative thirty-two thirds minus four thirds is negative thirty-six thirds, which is also twelve. I get eighteen. Oh. Some of you guys love that. Some of you guys realize what just happened here, sort of a shift. We looked at a problem like this, sort of, but now some of you guys are starting to realize, oh, so I can integrate either axis. So if my function I've got works better as a function of y than as a function of x, then I, I can just make it a function of y, and I can integrate dy. So you get a little more flexibility. So if you're like, that interval looks gross, what does it look like in the other way? You can do that with anything, any, any interval we've already done. You could actually try to turn it around if you wanted to. All right, so what I want to do, let's see if, this, if you guys can survive this. I want to try to do this again. I sort of started to write it out the other way. Can we try to do this again, but with the x variable? Because it'll work. It just won't be as nice. Right? So you guys are like, really that was nice. Why, why is that end so bad? I'm well, let's see. We're going to do it. You ready? Okay. It's not horrible. It's just not as nice as it could be. Right? That was relatively easy because it's all polynomial. It's all powers. So anytime I can use my power rule, I will because it's the easiest rule. Right? Uh, this isn't going to be horrible. I just have to realize that I've got to split it up from negative 3 to negative 1. So now I'm doing dx. And then from negative 1 to 5. Is that cool? Why do you have to split it up at that point? Yeah, why do you have to split it up? Because the top, the bottom is the straight line up until negative 1. And then the bottom is the other side of the parabola there. Do you guys see that? As so the, here, what's the top? Uh, the, 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 par the parabola. What's the bottom? The straight line. Yeah. Top is the parabola. Bottom is the straight line. Top is the parabola. Bottom is the straight line. Top is the parabola. Bottom is the parabola. Again. Oh, shit. Where does that shift? Where does that change? Right there, negative one. Because that's where the line ends. Let me let you absorb that. 
you, you see that. So what does that mean when you're hitting your... The, when the when there's a point, when there's an X value or a Y value, in the middle of your integration interval, you've got to split the interval up. If there's a point where things change. Right? So this one I was able to do across the entire interval on the Y axis because the relationship doesn't change. It's always the line is on top and the parameters on the bottom. If I want to do the X direction, oh shit, that's where the line is the bottom, that's where it stopped, and then past that it's the parabola is the bottom. I thought we were just doing one and five. That was where now that's the other thing. That was the lowest and highest for the X values, right? So that doesn't always tell you because see this over see how this runs over? Because this is not a function of X, right? It's a function of Y. So then it doesn't it doesn't have to. So I can go, oh shit, that's not a function. Yes, it is. It's a function of y. It passes this kind of test. Oh, you guys kind of with me? Uh -huh. So uh, if I have a function of x, there's no way in hell that if I find these two, that it's going to somehow go past that. The only way we can do that is if it can come back on itself. And the only way you can come back on yourself is if you're not really a function. So this is not a function in terms of x. It is a function in terms of y. It passes the vertical line test. If you're drawing vertical lines like that, so you, uh, the function doesn't. So that the parabola this way doesn't have to be a function to be uh, in, uh, der derivable or um, uh, integrable. Totally not, because right. intervals just care about the areas contained somewhere. So the, when we first start <coughs> learning about integration, we do the simplest example possible just to get used to integration. And that would be the interval between the x-axis and some function. Stop drawing that. So the x-axis and some function. Right? Right. So now I'm saying, well, it could be the y-axis and some function. I want to find this area, right? right? That's one thing by itself. And now I'm saying the interval, the area between two functions. So the interval doesn't care if it's a function or not, to be honest. Just like uh, in terms of, as long as I can break it up. So we're about to attack this thing. This is not even a function in terms of x, but we're going to do the interval anyway because I can break it up so that it is. So if I break it up from here to here, it's not, an, uh, it's not a single function, is it? So what am I going to look at it as? This function and that function. The top of a parabola is a function, and the bottom of a parabola, or you know, in this case it would be like the square root. All right. Please be with me. There's a lot kind of going on here. So you like the questions because I didn't have to get this deep into it right now, but it's good to do this. So many guys are like, no. So you, you cut it off at that point, and you you're you're going to take the integral of that part, making this part a function and this part a function. Yes. So cool. it's no longer like a parabola it. anymore. It's two. So functions. the integral doesn't care that I'm like this whole thing is not a function. The integral just says. That's a function, and that's a function. Take the difference of this. So how would you define the, or define the, the All right, here we go. We, we already did. Uh, so help me out. So this top piece, if I want to solve, so this is the this is the function that's given to me, and it's a function of x. Now how do I solve that for x and make two functions of y? Well, we know how to do that. Not solve for x, I'm sorry. How do I solve for y? y equals two. Yeah, so y equals positive. plus or minus. So this top one will be positive, right? Yeah. And the bottom one will be bullshit. So now I don't have one function. I'm finding the area between two functions. So this is why you know a parabola in general is not invertible because when you try to find its inverse, there's not a single function that meets that requirement. This is not a function, but that is a function, and that's a function. So there are two functions that meet that requirement, of course. And that's the whole idea of when you see a square root. Square root of 9, the answer is 3 because it's a positive root. There's the negative root. Well, how do you get that one? Put a negative sign on it. Right? So that's the idea of principal square root. I don't know if you guys remember that. When you see a square root symbol, it means the positive root. If you want the negative root, you got to put a freaking negative on it. I don't know if you guys remember that. If not, it's okay. Sort of. So what it goes inside, I should give myself more room. So I'm going from negative 3 to negative 1. That's where this relationship holds. Yeah. So the top function is rad 2x plus 6 minus, minus negative rad 2x plus 6, which turns into plus 
Good. And then what's going to go on the next guy? We get rid of all this extraneous yeah. stuff. And again, again, we're, yeah. we're six, right? some of you guys are like, you shouldn't be like this. You're just learning this. So don't freak out. You're just not used to it. That's all it is. You're just not used to it yet. You're not used to any damn thing yet when I first show it to you for the first time. Sure. <laughs> um, so it's it's going to take a little getting used to because we're not used to looking at things like that. We don't do that a lot, which is unfortunate, sort of. Uh, let's see. So what goes in here? Sorry. So now starting here, now, and now I'm looking at X, right? Now I'm looking at X. I can just stay like this. What's on the top? The positive rad 2 X plus 6, right? Yeah. And what's on the bottom? It comes to 6. Minus... X minus, X minus 1, because now I want everything in terms of a function of X. I like it. See, the, uh, the other thing is you got to keep in your mind. That's why I write this first. Do you see that? So I can always go, what the hell? Oh, yeah, X. I want functions of X. That's why, I, you, if you'll notice, I write that first. It's a habit. Uh, what did you just say? Well, minus X minus 1. Yeah. In parentheses, right. kick X. Easy, stupid little mistake to make. That would suck. So, thankfully, I have a teacher that actually... Creates all your work, gives you partial credit. Now, the teachers I've had, you got seven, the answer was five. I just left another, you got seven, the answer was five. Minus 28 points. Um, so, so, writing this again, so negative three to one, two. And how am I going to do that? You can use U sub, sure. Plus the integral of negative one to five, rad two x plus six, minus x plus one. Alright. Why, why did it go from negative 3 to negative 1 to negative oh, 3? I'm sorry. I left the negative off. Thank you. <coughs> so now I just gotta attack this. So you can use 2x plus 6. So if you do use U sub, let's use U sub just to get used to it. Uh, so on this first thing. You use 2x plus 6. This first guy, U would be 2x plus 6. Uh, du is 2dx. I guess. And I'm going to do the other way. So you could totally do like I have on the handout, where you, if x is negative 1, u is this. If x is negative 3, u is that. I'm not going to do that this time. I'm going to show you the other way to do this, which is just bring everything back to x at the end. You don't have to switch your limits if you don't want to. Let me make sure everybody's with me. So when you do u sub and you have limits, one way to do it is to change all your x limits to u limits. Right? So I would put, if u is 2x plus 6, when x is negative 1, what's u? Negative 2. Plus 6. six yeah. 2 is uh, 4. Yeah. Right? And so, and so you would make that 4. Well, let me do this another way. Let me do this the other way. Just show you. All right. So this I'm going to leave these. But remember, I think I already showed you a little bit. I put parentheses around just to remind me that they're for x, not for u. Not for u. So what's this inside going to become? And what do I? Yeah, I've got two already, don't I? That kicks ass. I normally don't have it. Two dx is du. Du. This is u to the one half. One half. Cool. Guess what you're saying over there? I just listen to you. Be better. All right, so I know we've got brand new shit, and then I got relatively new shit happening all at the same time. Oh well, too bad. Try to absorb it, try to get used to it. So now that we know U sub, it's going to show up a lot more often that we need it. We didn't really, really need it here, because I can integrate this and then just divide by an extra two, right? So two would come out. So it would still work out in the end. Uh, that's why that two is gone, because if I did it the other way, I'd divide by two and that two would be gone. I don't know if you guys are kind of with me or not, but it doesn't matter. If you did it that way, it's how it would work. Uh, plus, and over here, it's kind of nice. I can just use that same U sub, right? But you have to put a one half on the outside. I like it, exactly. We don't have the two there. So let me do this, let me do this real quick. Let me try to do, show you a little more work than normal. That last integral, we write it like this. Do you see how, I did, is everybody cool with that? These two came from where? The same. Right? Can I integrate this and integrate that? Because the interval is adding. Add all of this. Well, let me add these, and then I'll add those. And of course, the sum doesn't care. Right? The interval doesn't care. I can break an interval up. Why would I do that? Because this guy does not need you freaking sub. Right? 
So let's see, this guy can just borrow this. So I need, like you said, I need a two. So I better put a one half. So then I get one half, negative one to five. 2dx is du, u to the one half again, right? Yeah. And this one I can just do. Alright. So let's see, how do we do this here? That well, interval is what? U to the three times. Yeah. Two, you do the three halves times two thirds. Two, two thirds. Uh, and then I can bring back what U is. So this will be two thirds. Two x plus six. So three halves from negative three to negative one. Stay with me now. Some of you guys have totally given up. Just if you're getting tired, just stop writing. Just watch. Okay. I just want to verify that if we do it this way, we get the same answer, which was 18, right? The area is supposed to be 18. It should not matter which way I look at it. Well, the area is changing. No, it's the same stupid area. Right? Uh, let's see. And then this guy is going to work the same way, so it has a one half on it. So it'll be okay. u to the three halves times two thirds, one half. So it'll be one third u to the three halves. Right? It's one half of what this was. And of course, u is two half to six. And I want to go from negative one to five. And, that, and those I can just plug in. So, uh, get negative 25 over 2 plus 5 minus uh, negative 1 half minus 1. There you go. Good job, John. So, I'm just plugging stuff in there, right? Because I've already integrated it. So, plus 3 halves. So, let's see what we get here. I want you to plug a negative 1 in. Negative 2, which is 4. Yeah, negative 2 plus 6 is 4. What's 4 to the 3 halves? Uh, What's the square root of 4? 12 over 2, 6. Square root of 4 is 2. Cubed, 8. Right, because what's 3 halves power mean? The 2 means the square root. On the bottom of things are roots, just oh, like on right. plants. Mm -hmm. So the bottom is the root, the top is the power, because it's powerful, it's on top. That's the way I teach it. Uh, so the square root of 4 is 2. Cubed is 8. Plus 1 third. Square root of 4, 2 cubed is 8. No, wait, I'm sorry, I'm going too far. So for this guy, I plugged a negative 1 in, now let's plug a negative 3 in. 2 thirds, what's the negative 3 times 2? Zero. Negative, negative 6 plus 6 is? Zero. zero. Okay, good. Just want to show you that that happens. That was nice. So we should get a 10 on the other one. Let's find out. <laughs> plus 1 third, when you plug a 5 in, what do you get? 10. 16. 16. 16. Square root of 16 is 4, four cubed is 64, yes. minus, plug a negative 1 in, and we know what we get. We get the 4 again, right? Square root of 4 is 2, cubed is 8. What do those do? Part of them cancels out, we'll see that later. And then, uh, let's see where I'm at. 5 is in there, negative 1 is in there, good. And so I get whatever the hell I get from there. What do I get from there? Uh, I get negative 24 halves, right? So I get negative 12 plus 6. That's what it looks like. Right, so maybe, maybe just watch. This is, I mean, this gets a little boring. I totally understand. You're just trying to, just, it shouldn't be hard. You're just plugging stuff in and seeing what the hell it is. It's not difficult. You just got to have stamina to get through it. Right? It takes a lot of stamina. You're just to watch me doing a damn thing, too. I understand. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, now watch this, watch this. Uh, let me just show you this. It's not that big of a deal, but isn't that 8 thirds of 8? Yes. Yeah. So 8 thirds of 8 plus 2 thirds of 8 is 10 thirds of 8 minus 1 third of 8 is 9 thirds of 8, which is 3 times 8 is 24. <laughs> bam, bam, bam. <laughs> let me do it again. This is kind of cool. 64 is 8 times 8. Yeah. So this is 8 thirds of 8. Plus two thirds of eight is ten thirds of eight. Minus one third of eight is nine thirds of eight, which is three times eight, which is twenty-four. Right? People are always reaching for the calculators. I'm like, this is bad. You can, if you, the less you do the calculator, the more you make this kind of rules for yourself. And you can use that a lot of places. It's crazy. Anyway, that's your uh, 
Minus six, which is? Oh, yeah, 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 thank God. <laughs> Same thing we have before. Of course it is. The area doesn't give a shit which way you attack it. It's, let me multiply width times length instead of length times. Of course it's going to be the same. It doesn't matter if I'm looking at you this way or that way. Oh, good. So several things that were new to us there. I like it. Yes? Why is it one third Where are we at? Um, above one line above the other. Oh, uh, so this is, uh, what's the interval of u to the one half? It would be u to the three halves times two thirds, right? And one half of two thirds. Okay. Yeah. Cool. For yourself, the less steps you skip, the better for now. Right? Don't try to skip steps to save time because you save a lot of time and you make a lot of mistakes. So it doesn't really come out good. <laughs> I like that. Sympathy. All right. Cool. Uh, let's see. That was really cool to watch. I appreciate that. Ooh, how about this? Let's do let's do one with trig functions and then we'll no. look ahead a little bit. No. <laughs> or you want me just to surprise you with trig functions on the test? Let, let's just do some tricks so we're not so surprised. I love when you guys I'm like, do every damn thing now, Jeff. When I'm not being graded on it, do everything. Not oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to not test you on it. Uh, so, let's see. Here's a problem. So this is where your old pre-calc stuff becomes really, really important, which some of you guys have already shown me. You've forgotten? Because the first step is... And actually, let me, uh, let's see what happens here. Because they tell me to find the area between these. Do not... Make that mistake to think these are A and B necessarily. So it's just like that one A B. What are you looking for though? You're looking for if there's a C in the middle where things change. So you still have to find out where these two equal each other. You guys understand? So even if they give you an interval, don't just go integral negative pi over three pi. No, you got to investigate. Is something always on the top, or do they switch in the middle? You got to know. So how do I figure out where these guys meet? So they make up each other. And this is what we've forgotten how to do. Tan of x equals two sine. You could. You could move that to all a. <laughs> Wait, isn't there an identity in there? Maybe. It's two sine of x minus tan of x is in the same thing. Sine of x so you can change tangent sine over cosine. That sounds like it might be a good idea. One over cosine is. Could sine be zero? No. Could sine be zero? No. Yes. Yes. Do I want to divide by it then? No. No. I'm just I could subtract it. I could write this as sine x times, what's 1 over cosine? Sine. Secant x, right? Yeah. And then I could subtract 2 sine x. I, I think I hear somebody doing what I thought. If you multiply cosine x up, you would get 2 sine x cosine x, which is an identity. Or you just subtract sine x and then you can factor that. I, I would much rather do that, actually. So let me see if you guys understand. So if I multiply cosine x up, I get sine x equals 2 sine x cosine x. I could write this as sine 2x, but that's just silly. 